Hey everyone, welcome back to The Haunted Corner. I'm Ashton, and it's that time of the month again where I cover cold cases in a different state. This month, we're talking about a few cold cases in New York. If you have any information about the cases discussed in today's episode, please reach out to the correct authorities. Contact information will be listed in the show notes, on the blog post, and throughout the episode as well. Up first is the story of the murder of Yvonne Torch. We're heading back to 2004 in Newburgh, New York. Yvonne was 31 years old at the time this case took place. She was a young mother in 1990 when she began dating a man named Pierre Torch after meeting him at the fire station where her father was a volunteer firefighter. The two married the year after and welcomed a daughter together in 1993. The family settled into Newburgh and enjoyed life together. They would spend time hanging out by the pool, and Yvonne enjoyed shopping as well as cutting and styling hair. Because of this, her husband, Pierre, pushed her to get her cosmetology license. After finding a job proved to be harder than she expected, Yvonne decided to open up her own salon in 1994. She called the salon his and hers, Pierre helped with put painting and putting the fish finishing touches on the salon. Yvonne worked in the salon for the next 10 years and everything seemed to be going well. The family enjoyed vacationing and it was on one of these vacations to Disney World in May of 2004 when the family made a huge decision. They decided that when they got back home, they were going to pack up everything they owned and move to Florida. They planned on getting jobs at Disney and got to work on searching for homes in Florida as soon as they got back from their trip. So exciting things were going on. The family had lots to look forward to. And June 9th, 2004 started out as any other day would. Pierre made Yvonne breakfast and the two spent time together before Yvonne headed to the salon as she did every other day. Around 10 a.m., Pierre's grandmother went to the salon to get her hair done And the next customer who arrived at the salon discovered a grisly scene. Yvonne was dead on the floor of the salon. She had died of blunt force trauma between 1040 and 1055 that morning. When he was initially notified of a death at the salon, Yvonne's husband Pierre thought, okay, well, it's got to be one of the customers. Some of them were elderly, so he thought possibly one of them had passed away while at an appointment. It wasn't until he arrived at the salon that he was notified that it was his wife, Yvonne. According to reports, he was told by someone at the scene that she had hit her head. It wasn't until he received the death certificate a few days later that he realized that she had been murdered. Police looked into Pierre immediately because, of course, they did. He described it as living through three weeks of hell before police eventually ruled him out. Police were confused. The community was confused. Who would want to hurt Yvonne and why? The support for the family was immense. There was an incredible turnout at Yvonne's funeral of supporters who wanted to be there for the family and to grieve Yvonne. She was very loved and the community was really there for her family. But New York State Police were struggling to identify anyone who was involved with the murder. They weren't able to connect any suspects at the time, and that would remain true for the next almost 20 years. In 2022, the case was reopened by the New York State Police in hopes of turning up new information that may lead to an arrest. Anyone with information about the murder of Yvonne Porch is asked to contact the New York State Police Department at 845-344-5370 or by email at crimetip at troopers.ny.gov. Up next, we're heading back to 1973 to discuss the disappearance of Mitchell Weiser and Bonnie Bickwit. Mitchell was 16 years old at the time, and Bonnie was his 15-year-old girlfriend. The two met at John Dewey High School in Brooklyn, New York. They had tons of friends in the same group. Bonnie worked at the Well-Met Summer Camp, which she had attended when she was younger, and Mitchell had a job at a photography studio. Mitchell was described by those who knew him as, a fe- as fearless and a bit of a rebel. He was talented. He loved photography, baseball, and music, mainly the Grateful Dead. 
He even named his dog after one of their songs called Casey Jones. He had shoulder length hair that was usually pulled back into a ponytail, and he wore large gold rimmed glasses. He was about five foot seven. Bonnie was described as intelligent and strong-willed. She reportedly didn't want to attend the local high school after learning about the new John Dewey High School. So she wrote a letter to the principal asking to be allowed to attend the new school, and she was thrilled when she was accepted. Bonnie was a free spirit who also loved music and making people laugh. She was about four foot 11, and she had long brown hair. In 1973, Mitchell and his friend Larry purchased tickets for a concert in Watkins Glen. The concert was Summer Jam, and it featured the Grateful Dead, the Allman Brothers, and the band. All the greats. (laughs) Sounds like my kind of concert, to be honest. It's still considered one of the most attended concerts in the United States to date, with an estimated 600,000 attendees. Larry's mother had an unexplainable bad feeling about the concert, and she refused to let him go. So Mitchell decided to take his girlfriend, Bonnie, to the concert instead. Mitchell's mother, Shirley, was uneasy about the idea of her son traveling to the concert as well. She didn't want Mitchell and Bonnie hitchhiking, so she wanted to give him more money than the $25 that he had on him. But before she could, he ran out the door. Mitchell used the $25 for a bus ticket to Narrowsburg and a taxi to the campsite. Bonnie was working at the summer camp at the time, and when Mitchell showed up to take her to the concert, she asked for the weekend off. When her boss declined, Bonnie quit her job and told her boss that she would be back after the weekend to pick up her belongings and her final paycheck. This all tracks for me. Very teenager. I can't have the weekend off. Bye. (laughs) On the morning of July 27th, 1973, the teens had breakfast at the camp and caught a ride into Narrowsburg. Then, with what little money they had left, they stood alongside the road carrying sleeping bags and holding a cardboard sign that read Watkins Glen. They were both wearing jeans and t-shirts and they were last seen by a truck driver who picked the couple up when they were hitchhiking. The truck driver dropped them off shortly after he had picked them up, and they were never seen again. Of the estimated 600,000 people who left for Summer Jam, only Mitchell and Bonnie vanished that night. By Monday the 30th, Camp Wellmet had called Bonnie's mother and told her that she had never come back to retrieve her items or her final paycheck. When Mitchell didn't return home, his family jumped into action and began looking for him and Bonnie. The next day, Mitchell's father and sister drove the five hours from Brooklyn to Watkins Glen. There, they met with the police and gave them pictures of Mitchell and Bonnie, but police treated the missing teens as runaways. Shocker. So the families tried the New York Police Department, and when they wouldn't help, they went to the Sullivan County Sheriff's Office. But again, they were no help. So the families took matters into their own hands. They started looking everywhere they could think of. They took out ads in underground newspapers trying to communicate with the teens. They handed out thousands of flyers. They visited Native American reservations, hippie communes. They got local media involved and even hired a private detective. They went all out to find Bonnie and Mitchell, but they found nothing. And they struggled to understand why police weren't helping them find the teens. Mitchell's parents eventually moved to Arizona, but they continued to pay $2.39 every month to New York's telephone company to keep their name and Arizona telephone number in the Brooklyn phone directory in case their son ever tried to reach out to them. In 1998, an investigation discovered that there were many missteps in the handling of the case of the missing teens, including the Sullivan County Sheriff's Office and the New York City Police Department's missing persons squad losing original case files alongside a list of potential witnesses, investigators' notes, and the teens' dental records, which could have been used to identify the bodies. So, the cops screwed this one up, as per usual. In 2000, on the 25th high school reunion for Mitchell's class, friends took up a collection and planted a Norwegian red crimson maple tree in honor of their missing classmates. They also erected a plaque that read, 
Mitchell Weiser, Bonnie Bickwit. We still miss you, classes of 74 and 75. In 2000, New York City Detective William Kilgallen and State Police Investigator Roy Strever were assigned to reopen the case. At the time, MSNBC was working on a new true crime TV series called Missing Persons, and Mitchell and Bonnie's case was going to be featured on it. They sent a video crew, a journalist, and a psychic up to Camp Wellmet, where the couple left from before heading to the concert. The psychic was a man named Maurice Schickler, and he claimed that he had received visions of the teens. In his visions, he said that the teens were dead and buried in a rock quarry near the well-met camp r- campground. Maurice said, quote, I believe that the murder took place up on a hill. Mitchell was murdered by a man who was a Vietnam War veteran. He then murdered Bonnie in another location several days later, I believe. End quote. He also claimed that the man's name was Wayne, Wade, or Willie, and that he was still alive at the time. A few months later, after the episode of The Missing Persons had aired, calls began to come in to the number provided at the end of the episode. A man named Alan Smith had watched the episode and recognized the missing teens. Alan claimed that he knew the two from meeting them while hitchhiking together to the concert. It was a really hot day when a driver in an orange Volkswagen bus with Pennsylvania license plates picked up the three hitchhikers. The group was really hot, so they stopped to cool off in the Susquehanna River. Alan claimed that after Bonnie went into the river, she began to struggle and started to scream. Mitchell jumped in to help her, and the two were both swept away in the fast-moving currents. The driver of the van told Alan that he would call for police at a gas station, but there's no record of that ever happening. Alan said he believed the driver would call for help, so he claims that's the reason that he didn't call himself. Police, including Detective Kilgallen and Investigator Strever, tried to corroborate Alan's story. They interviewed his friends, who confirmed confirmed that he had been talking about the drowning since he returned from Summer Jam that year, but there were never any bodies found to confirm the story. They checked county coroner offices for unidentified bodies, but to no avail. The next step was to have Alan take a polygraph test, but before that could occur, the attacks on September 11, 2001 happened, and Detective Kilgallen and Investigator Strieber were reassigned. At that time, Bonnie and Mitchell's case was once again put to the side, and things went cold again until 2013. At that time, a woman from Florida called into the Sullivan County detective, Cyrus Barnes, and she claimed that she had information about the case and that she believed she knew who killed Mitchell. She dismissed the drowning theory and gave details to Cyrus about what she believed really happened. She told him that as an 11-year-old girl, she was with her father in a local restaurant when she approached a boy sitting at a table and asked him his name. He said it was Mitchell. She recalled the boy being uncomfortable and agitated. The information she gave to investigators was detailed enough that they secured digging equipment, sonar, and cadaver sniffing dogs to try to corroborate her information. The Joint State County Police search team excavated at two locations in Wayne, the family's nearby cottage, and a decommissioned New York State electric and gas power plant adjacent to a private residence. It's unclear how the daughter made the connection to the teen's case after 40 years or how she knew to contact the Sullivan County Sheriff's Office. Ultimately, nothing was found, and the case was turned over to Sullivan County Detective Jack Harb almost two years ago. Mitchell would be 66 and Bonnie would be 65 today. Their family and friends still hold out hope that one day their case will be solved. Mitchell's best friend, Stuart Carton, operates a website dedicated to keeping their story alive. I'll link to that on the blog for you to check out. Just this week, New York Governor Kathy Hochul has directed the state police to investigate the 50-year-old disappearance. And Senator Chuck Schumer has also asked the FBI to look into the case. So hopefully there will be some new information soon. 
But in the meantime, if you have any information about the case, please contact the Sullivan County Sheriff's Department at 914-794-7100. And finally, I have a shorter case for you that I really want to share and get the word out about. There's not a lot of information about this case, but this is what we do know. On Saturday, September 17, 2016, the Rochester Police Department responded to a house fire at 99 High Street. When firefighters arrived around 5.20 a.m., they found the back of the home and a vehicle on fire. There were seven people in the home at the time. Several people were able to escape, including two of Virginia Ortiz's children. But when she realized her other two children were still inside the home, she rushed back inside and upstairs to find them. The fire department was able to get the three victims out, Virginia Ortiz, her son Willie Nelson Jr., and her daughter Amia Nelson. They were rushed to the hospital, but all three died from smoke inhalation. It was discovered that the fire was intentionally lit in the front seat of in the front seat area of the 2005 Toyota Avalon that was parked in the driveway at the time. The fire quickly spread to the house. Surveillance footage from a neighbor's home shows people running from the scene after the fire began. The crime was quickly declared an arson, but no one has ever been arrested. No one has come forward with any information, and if they have, the police are keeping that information really close to their chest because there is nothing out there on this case, and I had never heard of it. Family members, including Virginia's surviving children, are hopeful that someone will come forward with information about the crime and who could have committed it. If you know anything about this case that you might think would be helpful, please come forward. Let's get justice for this amazing hero mother and her two babies. There's a $10,000 reward for information leading to an arrest in this case. Rochester police are asking anyone with information to contact them at 585-428-7157. While I was doing my research for this episode, I learned about a team of women who are taking on New York City's cold cases. This team inside New York City's chief medical examiner's office includes Aidan Naka, deputy director of forensic investigations, Siobhan Hudson, executive director of forensic investigations, and Dr. Angela Soler, assistant director of forensic anthropology. And they are pretty incredible. In the past two years, the team has solved 20 cold cases. Chief Medical Examiner Dr. Jason Graham said much of his office's expertise in forensic identification can be attributed to its experience with mass fatality incidents, including the 9-11 attacks and the pandemic. So shout out to them. They're doing God's work. And I think it's incredible that we have a group of powerhouse women out there solving cold cases. And that's going to do it for this month's Cold Case Corner. If you have any information about any of the cases we've discussed today, please reach out. No amount of information is too big or too small. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. The sources for the episode will be listed on the blog post, and that's linked to in the show notes. It's also available at www.thehauntedcorner.com. Check out the other episodes of The Haunted Corner available now wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts with new episodes dropping every week. If you're enjoying the podcast and would like to share your support, head on over to Patreon. You'll have access to the exclusive Patreon-only episodes, early and ad-free access to the regular feed episodes, plus so much more. Head over to patreon.com forward slash The Haunted Corner to join now. Follow us on social media at The Haunted Corner on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. If you're enjoying the podcast, be sure to tell a friend and rate and review wherever you listen subscribe on YouTube, do all the things. And if you have a case suggestion or a correction to share, please send it to thehauntedcorner at gmail.com or submit it through the website. Until next time, be kind, take care of yourselves, be kind to yourselves, be good to others, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.